If your toddler has been diagnosed with autism or is waiting for a diagnosis, you're going to want to pay attention for the next 60 seconds. Happy Ladders is parent-led early autism therapy that empowers you, the parent, to teach your toddler essential developmental skills through play. Studies have shown that the parent-led model is highly effective while eliminating frustration over long wait lists or the worry about losing precious developmental time, all without the disruption of people coming into your home. Happy Ladders includes activities that target 150 essential developmental skills every toddler needs, as well as assessments in four different developmental areas. There's also an exclusive community of parents just like you and professional coaching to ensure success for both you and your toddler. To learn more, get a free trial, and take advantage of an exclusive limited time offer for my listeners, visit happyladders.com. That's H-A-P-P-Y-L-A-D-D-E-R-S. Use the code THEAUTISMDAD at checkout to save 50% off the monthly membership. Plus, get a free one-on-one session as well as access to the Tantrums and Meltdown mini course. This is a limited time offer, so act now. If your toddler has been diagnosed with autism or is waiting for a diagnosis, you're going to want to pay attention for the next 60 seconds. Happy Ladders is parent-led early autism therapy that empowers you, the parent, to teach your toddler essential developmental skills through play. Studies have shown that the parent-led model is highly effective while eliminating frustration over long wait lists or the worry about losing precious developmental time, all without the disruption of people coming into your home. Happy Ladders includes activities that target 150 essential developmental skills every toddler needs, as well as assessments in four different developmental areas. There's also an exclusive community of parents just like you and professional coaching to ensure success for both you and your toddler. To learn more, get a free trial, and take advantage of an exclusive limited time offer for my listeners, visit happyladders.com. That's H-A-P-P-Y-L-A-D-D-E-R-S. Use the code THEAUTISMDAD at checkout to save 50% off the monthly membership. Plus, get a free one-on-one session as well as access to the Tantrums and Meltdown mini course. This is a limited time offer, so act now. Hey, everybody. Uh, My name is Rob Gorski, and this is the Autism Dad Podcast. Uh, Today, I'm going to be speaking with my good friend, Joel Manser. He is a fellow autism dad. He has a website called Autisable and a podcast called Autisable Dads. Uh, I co-host that on occasion, and I just thought it would be cool to have Joel on and sort of introduce him to you guys and um, kind of get caught up on some of the things that he's doing to better the autism community, and then maybe we'll have a conversation about some things that are going on that... that, uh, need to be talked about. So stay tuned. I appreciate you guys tuning in and we'll be right back. The autism dad is brought to you by Lackey kid. Have you ever wondered where to find the best sensory tools for children with autism? Dealing with sensory issues can be very challenging for families like mine. Thankfully there's Lackey kid. Lackey kid was founded by an autism dad to provide support, education, and other tools that can help children with anxiety, sleep, attention span, and sensory processing issues. They've helped thousands of autism families improve the quality of their lives. Visit lackeykid.com forward slash the autism dad and find out how you can receive a free sensory toy. This is a limited time offer while supplies last. So visit lackeykid.com forward slash the autism dad for more information. The autism dad is brought to you by Mightier. Mightier is an amazing program out of Harvard Medical and Boston Children's that utilizes video games in a wrist strap heart rate monitor to teach your kids to emotionally self-regulate. So if you are an autism parent like I am, that means fewer meltdowns. Your meltdowns means reduced parental stress and improved quality of life for your entire family. Uh, I've been using it with my son for over a year. It's absolutely fantastic. The games are fun. They're engaging. He loves it. Uh, doesn't even realize that he's learning while he's doing it. And then he naturally applies it to the rest of his life. It's basically biofeedback for kids. So it does work for any child. Uh, but due to the nature of, of autism, kids on the spectrum tend to have a more difficult time with emotional self-regulation. And so Mightier has a, has a very profound impact on that. So if you want more information, including how to get a free 30-day trial, visit theautismdad.com forward slash Mightier. That's theautismdad.com forward slash Mightier. All right, so we're back, and uh, like I said, today I'm talking with uh, my friend Joel Manzer, who is the, how do you want to say it, owner, operator, creator of Autisable? Uh, Founding lead editor. Founding lead editor, that sounds... It sounds so choice, doesn't it? It's it. (laughs) It's so sophisticated. (laughs) Uh, Um. And so Joel and I had been working on, well, Joel has a podcast called Autisable Dads, and him and I were co-hosts uh, of that. And uh, we still will do uh, joint episodes, but we're also, um, 
doing some solo things. And so I think what we wanted to do today was just sort of play catch up and kind of let you guys know what was going on and uh, get you kind of caught up on, on what's going on with Joel and, and Autisable and the Autisable Dads podcast. So, uh, Joel? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we got a lot going on. I mean, you and I have did a season one of Autisable Dads on a completely separate server. Um, completely separate program, uh, thanks to the help of Marianne. And uh, last year, uh, started to branch out with Autisable Dads just by, you know, you and me and you and I through scheduling challenges because, you know, you're an autism dad with a bunch of kids and, you know, going on there. And I'm having to, you know, find ways to pay the bills and do things. So our scheduling wasn't as such that we could actually do this. Mm -hmm. on a regular basis so you're the one who said joel check out anchor check out this check out i did that. i did and i was like you know that's awesome i think we should do that and although you and i have ch chatted on the phone having a quiet environment <laughs> is always a challenge when you got kids running around like yeah. crazy and so scheduling became a challenge and here we are finally able to go, all right, kids are back at school, or what can we do to quickly knock out a uh, podcast episode to catch everybody up? And this has not been without its technical challenges because um, nothing ever seems to want to work right. So <laughs> yeah, I, I think this is going to work out. <laughs> seems, we'll see. seems to be good. We're a couple minutes in and no issues. So I think we're good. Yeah. Um, yes. So what... Um, what kind of things are you looking to do with, uh, autismal dads this year or this season? Well, well, this, this particular season, um, I just, uh, finished recording a podcast episode with, uh, a gentleman named Donnie Grimler. He is the vice president of music education with a uh, guitar center. And we we're talking about music education, how it's impact on people's social skills and be able to reduce stress um, has really helped a lot of benefit a lot of people. And I, you know, it's Guitar Center has a lot of uh, educational uh, tools, resources, teachers that can be able to help out on a, you know, one-on-one -on -one basis, things like that. So that was pretty cool. And I didn't know this, but he's got a kid with selective mutism. So, which was very interesting. Really? And music, music, yeah, social anxiety is a huge contributor to selective mutism. And, you know, people's ability to be able to communicate is a huge aspect of, as you know, autism. Mm -hmm. So uh, that was something that, you know, we chatted about and bringing about that. There's going to be a gentleman. I recorded some podcast episodes last year that I haven't had a chance to distribute. So I was very encouraged to, um, get get on board with patreon we have some patreon supporters mm -hmm. and um being able to continue the efforts with autisable dads so now that we and with autisable itself and that's the pretty cool thing is that autisable dads is just an offshoot of autisable so i was very glad that we were able to uh, keep things going you know, with well, website right and so you you brought up autisable for those um, out there who aren't familiar with uh, what you do there. Can you talk about what Autisable is and, and sort of what it does for the community? Yeah, the goal of Autisable is really to connect the autism community. It doesn't matter what your background is. If you have an interest in autism, uh, whether you're autistic, uh, well, welcome aboard. Uh, you're a professional. You're a parent. Um, the idea is to provide a safe environment for anybody to be able to share their thoughts and ideas. Um, in the past, the way the TISBA was, was that you just create a website and go. You know, you have your own blog and you can just roll with it. The challenge with that is that there were a lot of spam accounts. And so um, when TISBA relaunched, TISBA used to be owned by a company called Zanga, xanga.com. And it was one of their niche blogging community sites. And it was great. People love the functionality of it. Um, but it did lend itself to being very spammy. So you'd have 
spam accounts on there. You'd have um, people being able to bully each other pretty easily um, and the like. We want to promote discussion, but we want to promote an, promote an environment where there can be safe discussion. So that's when, the, when we relaunched, I took ownership of the site uh, through Autism LLC. We took ownership of the site from Zanga, and we created a membership wall. And what that invariably does is that people log in and then they could be able to share things. They'll have their own news feed. It's kind of like has a Facebook type of feel to it. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, they can be able to submit blog posts to our editors that we would share publicly. And that's on the front end. That's what you see publicly without a membership account. And it's free to use for anybody. It's, it's one of those things where it's like, well, I don't want a website, but I need to share about this. But I also don't want to be on Facebook sharing my thoughts on autism, um, but I want to be able to express. And sometimes Facebook groups isn't always the best place uh, for some folks. Mm -hmm. um, so it provides an alternative to Facebook groups. Um, it's also a place where if somebody's blocking about autism and they have their own website like yours, uh, we syndicate. So we'll, we've, we've currently have well over 70 to 80 syndications mm -hmm. happening on the site. These are nonprofits and websites like yours, Rob, mm -hmm. that we do appropriate syndication. And we, you know, these folks have an account on our site from Autism Society to um, even the, the 100,000 pound gorilla, Autism Speaks. Um, <laughs> They, you know, and I say that lovingly because they do have some decent content from good contributors that can benefit. Um, but it's one of those things that's put in perspective. All of these nonprofits, all of these bloggers, they're sharing the various different points of views and perspectives surrounding the very dynamic conversation of autism. And so I've had preconceived ideas and notions on specific topics and it's taken either professionals or other parents and quite often autistic individuals who have really just slapped me upside my head and said, no, that's not really the way it is, Joel. <laughs> but, so, and I've learned a lot of new things because of that. And that's helped me understand my son more. Um, so, hmm? Well, I was going to ask, I was going to say, so in a lot of ways, you're sort of bridging some gaps. Um, you know, one of one of the things that I I have found uh, over the years is is that especially with parents, um, you know, there's a lot of judgment and ridicule and things like that, and so people are less they're more hesitant to to talk about what's going on in their lives because they fear ridicule and judgment and uh, you know being bullied or, or things like that and having an environment where where you know it's monitored to to eliminate that type you know that type of thing uh I, I think allows people to more freely communicate and you know allows parents to uh you know learn from autistic adults and and i you know and i think autistic adults can learn from parents as well you know we can sort of you sort of bridge that gap and and foster healthy communication so yeah, that's a good thing. Yeah, yeah. I think I think one of the biggest challenges in the autism community. You and I became part of the autism community really during the beginning of this upsurge in diagnoses. Mm -hmm. And so I remember first coming on board. It was the prevalence rate was near one in two hundred. Yeah, yeah. Prevalence rate, and now it's one in fifty four, one in fifty three, and in New Jersey it's like one in thirty six or so. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's the, it's the, we have so many people learning so many things so fast. Keeping that perspective of this is someone, parents can be very, I'm going to rewind a little bit. Parents can be very passionate about their children. I mean, we are, we want to protect them. We want to help them. And so we get, we can latch onto this concept or idea, like it's the end all be all and that's it for everybody. But as you and I have learned over the years that, you know, <laughs> each one of your kids has its own plethora of challenges, its own microcosm of um, 
Ways challenges. to stress me out. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's one way to put it. Um, but it's, I mean, it's, I, well, I, I mean that in the most loving way. Yeah, yeah. I, my kids are awesome. Yeah. I, I love my kids. Yeah, we we <clears> kid, <throat> we joke, we jest, but it's one of those things that putting that into perspective and remind. Sometimes I'm finding myself having to remind parents, you know, this is your kid, this is your child, and no way should we demean their experience, their point of view, or their perspective? And then you have people who are on the spectrum who are very vocal, who have their opinions, and they have had, some of them have very, very traumatic experiences associated with certain types of therapies or treatment, or even traumatic experience from their own parents. Now, we have to learn from that. We have to learn from these mistakes. You know, what was it that benefited them and what was it that did not benefit them? And trying to understand from that perspective and how we can be able to be better as parents in our fight so we can fight alongside and unite the community rather than say, you know, Get odds. yeah, we're, we're not, we're not here to combat, be combative. We're, com we're here to, to address certain issues. There was a post I did um, that we shared. It wasn't that I did it. It's just that we shared on Autismal's Facebook page that you know the 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 different terminologies that we use, such as you know an autistic individual or someone with autism. Now, I use those interchangeably depending on the grammar and depending on how it fits within the construct of the article being shared or the person's perspective or what their if that article says I am autistic, well, that's going to be the verbiage we're going to try to use, you know, when, you know, when we're going through the editorial process. But if it says someone with autism, then we're going to use that. So we'll use them interchangeably. The, the, the reason we use it interchangeably is because it's someone who has the autism diagnosis. Does it change who they are? No. It, at the end of the day, it may matter to specific individuals on what terminology is used. But the reality is when you're really looking at the broader scope of things is that this individual has that diagnosis, how we verbalize it and how we get that message across really depends upon the context, um, grammar wise, and also context within, you know, how it lays out, but there are arguments within the community on what should be used. And well, so, I mean, so you know what I'm saying. So it's like there's terminology that tends to, um, could, could either be the wall that prevents us from connecting, or mm -hmm. be that chasm that that separates us as a community, or it could be that we overlook that, build a bridge in that communication with an understanding that we know what the person's saying, but we don't always have to correct them. We just know that what they're saying right. is what they're trying to, the message they're trying to create, the overarching message of what they're trying to share is, is it positive? Is it constructive? Yes. Are there things that I agree with how it's said? Possibly not, but I appreciate that this person is saying what they're saying because it's actually trying to promote inclusive, inclusiveness. It's trying to promote um, building that gap, building that bridge. And so those are the types of things that, you know, as over the years, you and I have talked about these, you know, we can slough it off to semantics, but those are the types of things that as we connect the autism community, we're finding that it's that terminology, it's those types of things that we have to build those bridges in order as a community to be able to work together in our communication efforts. And that's not just autistic individuals, it's us as parents. We have to learn, we have to understand. Yeah, one of the one of the things that I've I've found um and it's it's frustrating and it's sort of why I just don't play the semantics game anymore. And and we've talked about this. Nobody agrees on mm -hmm. what's okay and what's not okay. And it, it it's all based on opinion. And when you know, you can, you can have people, you know, express the fact that they're offended that you've said things a certain way. Um, but then if you say it 
a different way, then someone else is offended. Well, and there's really, there's really no way uh, to, to win that. And, and so for myself, I, I just don't, I just don't play it. I use them, like you said, interchangeably to me, they mean the same thing. And I agree with you that, you know, it's, it's more, it's more about the context and the tone and, um, you know, the, the way that they're being used, you know, if it's derogatory, it doesn't matter which way they're being used. Derogatory is derogatory. Um, right. But if it's a positive, you know, message and it just isn't worded exactly the way that someone might prefer it to be worded, we need to be able to look past that and focus on the fact that we have somebody who is trying to do something positive for the community. And yeah, and instead of alienating think, those people, we, yeah. we can embrace them. Yeah, I think I think this goes on both sides of the camps of this per, this particular example of you know are they autistic or they with autism or they have autism, um, and it's it's about understanding the there's kind of like a, a thread of conversation in in you know when somebody's trying to share a message or share a, a link or share something specific and they're trying to deal with something in a very positive constructive manner it can be difficult for some folks even myself to say oh that is positive we taking things too literally sometimes hinders us yeah. and it can be a challenge for some people to look at things more figuratively yeah. Um, myself included. I'm just your typical neurotypical dad, you know. So, um, you know, there's sometimes I have to kind of go, wait a minute, hold on a second. And every once in a while, you know, there are people that help me out on autism to deal with the editorial side of things, and they'll bring something to my attention, and they'll go, and something that I never even think of, mm -hmm. and and I'll go, you know, something you're right. You know, I never thought that that would be an article that could be extraordinarily offensive. You know, it it doesn't it didn't dawn on me when I'm going through these articles to, you know, share on the site that you know sometimes you get an article that looks awesome, the title's great, the presentation's good, but when you're looking at the overall article, um, that somebody posted for us to share, um, it's actually hypocritical, in in a negative, non-constructive way. But because it has a lot of fluff and a lot of, you know, and is presented well, it it can come across that way, you know, to, to other people. Also, there's some times where you, you know, we might have an article that, you know, blog post that somebody's sharing with the editors to review, and we're like, oh, that looks great. But it's really not the message to convey because it's, you know, you have a huge segment of the autism community that would, you know, just backlash from it. Be offended. Not be cons it, well, or, find just, it, or find it offensive or, 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 yeah. or even the general public would be like, why are you talking about this? That issue is resolved. You know, type of, we want to promote discussion, but sometimes discussion on certain topics is best reserved for um, a podcast episode, mm -hmm. you know, or best reserved for other things. Cause the written words, the written language um, does have its limitation. A lot of times we're better communicators when we see the body language or we hear the vocal inflections. And that's 80% of our communications as humans is really through body language and vocal inflections. The rest of it is the 20%, the, the, what we're actually saying. Yeah. And so it's, Understanding that as you're going into the what we post, you know, you get one sentence and the structure is slightly off, but you know what you're trying to say and convey, but the structure is slightly off. I've actually had to push back on a couple of articles that were actually really good articles, but because there were a few sentences that needed to be reported, sometimes autistic individuals or even parents, they'll submit something and I'll look at it and I'll have to say, Take a look at that sentence again. Speak it out loud to yourself. Read it out loud to yourself five or six times. And then bounce that off of somebody who's in front of you. And see what their feedback is. And say, I'm trying to convey this type of message. Does, does what I'm writing and sharing with you, 
convey this type of message. If they don't sync up, then it's probably not the best thing to write. <laughs> so I've I've had that with my own with my own writing. I'll bounce yeah. something off my wife. I'll bounce something off my wife and, and she'll she'll say, Joel, I know what you're trying to say. But that's you need to probably do better, not, Joel. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, let's be honest. Um and so it's like, oh, okay. And so there have been times where we've had some submissions from autistic individuals and I'll get a message on Facebook or something saying, Hey, I'm working on this article. It's titled this. Can you look it up on, on my account for me? And I'm like, yeah, sure. So we'll look at the draft version in our account, see what's going on. And it's like, Oh, okay. I see what you're trying to say. You're trying to say this and we'll type it out and we'll wait for the response. And it could be a day, two days, a week before the response comes. And, you know, I'll take a look at it and I'll go, oh, that, I think that is probably what you're trying to say, right? And they're like, yes, it's difficult for anybody to find the words to say uh, whatever it is they want to say. Sometimes they need a little nudge, a little push. Sometimes they need a little bit of redirection just to get the message across to where it doesn't slap them back in the face. Because nobody wants that criticism. You know, they don't want it to be... Um, they don't want that message that they're trying to share because that's their personal experience of being autistic or that's their personal experience as a parent. Nobody wants that criticism. That's what hinders people being able to share their story, share their journey. We want to be able to express ourselves. In fact, it's healthy as humans to express ourselves. So that actually leads me to a question. Mm -hmm. Uh, How do you handle that? Let's say people uh, have a disagreement, you know, over something that was written on autism. Do you know, and someone may be offended by word choice, or or maybe there's just someone who's just attacking uh, somebody else in order to keep the community safe and Mm -hmm. and allow people to feel um, that they can express themselves freely and constructively you know well how do you how do you how do you how do you uh that's a good question moderate that yeah that's a good question um yeah i mean it's something (laughs) that needs to be discussed (laughs) um i think Stuart duncan actually has a better um with oddcraft has a better um way of going about it because the way that he addresses moderation with Oddcraft is, you know, zero tolerance for bullying. Um, zero, you know, you you address it. But the bigger thing is, is that, that whenever he shares something to where he's actually talked somebody dealing with bullying, is that all right? Well, you're having an issue with this person. Let's talk about it. Let's go off to the side and let's talk about it. Let's see what's going on. You know, let's see what is it that you're having an issue with, and let's talk about it. You know, and and it hasn't been a huge issue on autism. And the reason for that is is because a lot of people that are currently on the site, they're experienced bloggers. They're experienced, you know, you have experienced people like you and myself who have been around a while Mm -hmm. that understand that maybe you're saying it, maybe you're trying to say it a certain way, but it's not coming across as the way you think it is. Right. You know, this is how we're receiving it. So you have you have people trying to convey a message. And then on the flip side, we have people trying to receive the message. And so there's that translation there that sometimes that communication is lost in translation. And I'm not talking the movie. I'm just talking, you know, sometimes that's just the way it is. And so it's reminding folks that is this what you're really trying to say and encouraging people to act in that fashion is repeating back to saying, when you said this or you wrote this, are you really meaning this? And if if that's the case, I don't understand. Can you explain further? And not trying to, you know, in the process, encouraging people not to be, jump to being judgmental, but in the process, trying to encourage people to be more understanding and accepting that, You know, recently we heard about, you know, Ellen sharing about her experience of social media backlash just by sitting next to George Bush. 
mm-hmm. you know, W. Now, politically, you couldn't get any more diverse than that. No. You know, from their own personal perspectives. There are people who have completely opposite political views than I do. We have people who have completely opposite religious views than I do. I don't really care, but I'm, you know, what people believe in or what is going on with them, so long as they are respectful of other people's beliefs. You know, whatever, Mm -hmm. because what you experience is your experience. I can't take that away from you. That is your experience. That's your life. You've, you've experienced that your entire life. You know, it's sometimes I choke with you saying, dude, man, I don't know how you can do it with three kids. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm barely making it mentally with my one, you know, and, and you keep reminding me, Joel, that's just my normal. If something was normal, <laughs> I wouldn't know what to do. Come um, up for a visit, Joel. Yeah. Baby, <laughs> babysit for me. I know. Right. Yeah. But I think that's, I think that's the, it's, it's having that empathy. It's having that understanding that your life experiences are completely different than mine and vice versa. And then reminding people of that. Well, and, there, and everything, times, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I was going to well, say, everything times, is, uh, all right, try it again. You go. <laughs> <laughs> well, a lot of times um, when we're dealing with social media, we want to get our message across. We want to get our, our perspective out there, completely alienating the person that we're trying to communicate with. Mm-hmm. And yeah, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, and everything is subjective too. So like mm-hmm. when you had mentioned that, you know, you'll joke sometimes about, uh, you don't know how I do it with my kids or something. Mm-hmm. There, there are some people that would take offense to that. Like, Oh yeah. Well, what are you saying, Joel? Like, well, you know, <laughs> and know. I'm like, and I'm like, Joel, I don't know how I do it. My kids drive me crazy. I, I <laughs> like, I have no problem saying that. I tell them that you guys drive me crazy. I love them. Yeah. They know that uh, yeah. kids are on this planet. And, and I've talked about this, like kids have been put on this planet to drive their parents crazy. It's like a rite of passage. I drove mm-hmm. my parents nuts. My kids will drive me nuts. Their kids will drive them nuts. It it has nothing to do uh, just it's because a circle they're of life, Rob. Yeah, it's it's, it's not isolated life. to the fact that they're autistic. That it's it's like that. But people they seem to to focus so much on that that when you say something like you know they know that your your son is autistic and you say something like oh my god they're driving me nuts today. People are like how could you say that? Like that's so mean. Like he can't help himself. Or like. But it's nothing to do with that. It's kids drive their parents crazy, period. That's just <laughs> it doesn't, life. It doesn't, it's just life. There's, just, <laughs> there's different challenges that are associated mm-hmm. with different situations, but it, it's, it's all subjective. And, mm-hmm. and uh, talking about that freely is, is not, a ne- in my opinion, is not a negative thing. It's just, I mean, it's just be real about it and not... Well, I think yeah. I think one of the th- one of the things that you know blogging about autism has shown me, or just sharing my perspective on it, and then reading other people's opinions and what they're going through, has reminded me of of the mental health capacity associated mm-hmm. with what we're doing. Um, you often share that writing is your is very cathartic for you. It's your release of your stress. <laughs> it's my lifeline, man. It's yeah, all, yeah. It's, keeps me from going crazier. Yeah. Yeah. And so you have the, you have the boldness to be able to share your experience and say, this is my life. But at the same token, it is also your outlet to be able to share yeah. with others what you're going through. It's kind of like, let's talk it out type of thing. Yeah. It's like, I'm going through this. I need to talk it out because if I don't, I'm going to go nuts. And, you know, it's, it's along those lines of being able to share one's opinion or one's thing and opinions can change, you mm-hmm. know, there, but it's being able to share that opinion at that moment and be able to get that out of your head. So you're not going completely crazy. Writing yeah. to me, is very cathartic, but I'm a little bit more specific in what I write about. And I'm, you know, um, I don't write as often as you. And quite frankly, if I did, I'd probably burn out <laughs> just by writing. Um, but that's the difference between you and me is that that's your, I'm 12, that's who you're. I'm, I'm 12,000 posts in Joel. I know. I know. 12,000 in 10 years. I know you're, you're, you're going over a thousand, a 
a thousand posts a year in a heartbeat. It's ins- it, well, and you're right about the burnout. It's yeah. it it just that's why I actually yeah, started the, the podcasting. Um, at, at, well, yeah. when we when we had talked about how you know we were doing autismal dads together, and then I started doing a little bit on my own, you started doing a little bit on your own. Uh, mm-hmm. It wasn't like a breakup or something like that. It was, yeah. it was, uh, I got tired of writing. Like I just, yeah. I couldn't do it anymore. And I needed another outlet to express myself in mm-hmm. a constructive way that, yeah. you know, hopefully, I mean, it benefits me, hopefully it benefits others. And it allows me to get back to writing, which is something that I really love to do. So yeah, I, I totally yeah, it, it is. Yeah. Every, everybody does it in their own way. They share what they're comfortable sharing. Yeah, I, I do it my way. You do it your way. Someone else does yep. it their way. But everything yep. is education. Every everything is 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 helping people to better understand what transpires. Yeah, yeah it's. I get a lot of questions asking like, "What's autism going to become?" I don't know what's going to become. I know that it's a website that has benefited a lot of people around the world. Um, educators use it as a resource. Uh, professionals use it as a resource to connect with the autism community mm-hmm. um, so that they can be able to understand more. They throw other parents towards the website. Um, I've, I've found backlinks from uh, school systems in Australia that actually say, go here to understand what parents are going through dealing with autism. Um, and that's fine. You know, I'm, I'm grateful for it. In fact, some of those folks have actually emailed me and messaged me and said, when not this was down for two years, they emailed me and messaged me and they said, Joel, we, where did this resource go? Are you going to have it back online? Because it's proven to be a very good resource for parents that I help. And I'm going, oh, okay. And it's one of the driving factors why we keep the site going. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's people don't have a full understanding of autism not because they don't want to know, but because it's such a dynamic topic that it's difficult to nail down and slap a label on something that impacts people in such a variety of different ways. Yeah. It's not a cookie cutter no. uh, thing. And that's part of one of the things that has always been really frustrating was that, you know, w- when, when 10 people are lined up and they all share the same autism diagnosis, all 10 of them are, are unique uh, individuals with, with different strengths and weaknesses and likes and dislikes and, mm-hmm. and they're human. It, it, yeah. It throws people off because they think, well, it's like if you have a broken arm, you have a broken mm-hmm. arm, you have a broken arm. Or if you have, you know, not to compare autism with diabetes or something, but like if you have diabetes, you know what diabetes is for you. You know what diabetes probably is for the next person and the next person and the next person. There's some variance, but with autism, it's, it's the same name, but it, but it's, it's encompassing it's infinite, the, infinite possibilities. Yeah. And, it's the spectrum. It's the spectrum aspect of it that confuses and confounds people. Yeah, you have, you know, we have these labels of HFA or Asperger's. We have these labels of nonverbal. We have these, you know, different stages or different types of autism. It's all these labels, but it's it's this umbrella diagnosis that that is really, you know, there's things that my son does that are the antithesis of a typical autism diagnosis. Mm-hmm. My son is very. He can be very personable. He would want to hug. He want to be around. He wants to be where the people are. He 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 wants to be very social. He just has difficulty communicating verbally. Mm-hmm. But he he wants to do that. There are a bunch of autistic individuals that are like him in that capacity. They want they want that that hug. They want that uh, communication. They want that interaction. But then there's a huge group that don't want that sensory input. They'd yeah. rather be by themselves. And so understanding the dynamic that that you have these different segments of the population, with different beliefs and different thought processes uh, and different perspectives, there are people that are on the spectrum that are extremely verbal and verbose 
that I've learned from that have actually given me some insight into my own son. Oh yeah. And it's it's just like there are people who are nonverbal like Carly Fleischman who have given me a lot of insight about my son as well. So it's, it isn't like you said, it's not a cookie cutter thing. There's, Mm -hmm. there's bits and pieces and what I call little nuggets of truth across the entire uh, community. Yeah, there's there's commonalities, but mm-hmm. there's overlap. But there are, um, you know, like with with my kids, all three of them fall under the autism diagnosis, right? But mm-hmm. I, my oldest is is much. He's more cognitively impaired, and, right. and so you know, if you're going higher or lower functioning, he's, he's much lower functioning. He, he's, he's at a functional level of about a five-year-old and he's going to be 20 in January. Mm-hmm. Um, my other two uh, are very high functioning and they're sort of the opposite. You know, they're 13 and 11, but they're actually much more advanced than that. And so, I mean, people think like that's all, oh, that's awesome. But that, that predict uh, that presents unique challenges in and of itself, because there's a difference between, uh, cognitive ability and emotional ability, and mm-hmm. and there can be a lot of internal conflict. And and you know you would you look at my kids, and uh, some people wouldn't, most people probably wouldn't wouldn't look at them and say, oh, they're autistic. I mean, because autism doesn't look like anything. It's yeah. just it's well, you you know what I mean. Like people, like you, you don't he you, you don't look autistic. Oh, okay. Well, I guess I didn't. Uh, it's do the, I need it's to change the, it's, shirt? It's the hair. Um, it's the hair. I got I a like hair. That. I got I got a haircut. <laughs> <laughs> I love that response. It's context. I mean, I that. It's the context. I know. Uh, oh yeah, I got a I got a haircut. I got a haircut. That's why. <laughs> I got a haircut. Um, what does that have to do with your kid? Absolutely nothing. Yeah. So it is, it is, it's, it's, it's a tough thing. And, and I think that there's, you know, getting people to understand, you know, it's, fr- it's frustrating as a, as a parent advocate who is trying to make the world a more accommodating, accepting, loving, empathetic, whatever place for my kids, mm-hmm. uh, because trying to explain autism to the world is not easy to do. I've lived with my kids their entire life. I don't fully understand it. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, every day I I run into new, interesting, whatever things. And, and so it's a very, it's a very fluid dynamic uh, situation. And everybody is so profoundly different that you can't, you you can't really categorize people. You know, there's so many stereotypes out there and, and those stereotypes may fit here and there, you know, there may be right. characteristics that are stereotypical that will that will show up, you know, whatever. But there's plenty of people out there that have very few of those stereotypical um, oh, yeah. uh, attributes, and and it, it doesn't make them any less uh, autistic or any more autistic. It's it's just it's everybody is different, and it's hard to get people to understand a human condition that is one of the most mysterious things. Uh, we don't we don't know as much as we know there is so much more that we don't and yeah yeah and and i've actually had people who are on the spectrum just share um with me personally that they have difficulty communicating you know they they do they'll spend one i can mention one individual he spent quite literally early on in the early days of his book he would spend three, four hours just writing a paragraph to, mm. to blog, um, to blog about because he would just, he would stress and suffer over the words that he was used mm-hmm. because, you know, he was having difficult communicating Well, in talking with him further. The, the reason for that communication on his end was that he, he was actually extremely empathetic towards parents and professionals who would read. What he's writing and he wants to be very careful with what he's yeah and i appreciated him for being honest with me but it took us it did take us probably about you know a few weeks back and forth to to for me to ask him so where is his fear and his fear was was coming out in terms of anger and in the words that he chose and the words that he used and responding to people it came across as angry 
Yeah. But that, but in, but the reality was, is that he wasn't angry at all. He was actually struggling and he was stressed out and struggling um, with communicating. And so it came across when he was typing as anger. And so we figured out after back and forth, it's like, well, what are you, what's going on here? What's, what are you trying to convey? And he would say, well, I'm trying to convey this. And he would share with me what he's trying to convey. And all this was just written out. And it was on the old, old platform that, that a Tisbal was on. And I say, oh, so you're really trying to convey something constructive and something along these lines. He goes, yeah, I just can't find the words. Now, mind you, when he, when he responded, yeah, I can't find the words, it took, it, I sent that like early in the week, you know, what's going on, what are you trying to convey? And it took about three to four days for him to respond back to me. I just can't find the words. That to me was a turning point of his ability to communicate because he recognized that he couldn't find the words that could convey what he was really trying to think. And so he was getting frustrated and he would overthink what he was trying to convey. And he would write a sentence over and over and over again, 300 different ways. Mm -hmm. So I just had to remind him, we'll take a step back, revisit what you have to say, Save the article that you're working on. No worries. It ain't going anywhere. You know, that article's not going anywhere. And go back and revisit it in like a few days. You might have a fresh perspective on what to say. Sometimes even, even us neurotypical people, when we're writing, we're, we're so close to the fray, we tend to forget. Sometimes, sometimes there's blog posts I've written that I haven't published yet just because I need to take a second look at it later because it mm -hmm. could be that controversial. And so I had to remind him that that is normal. Believe it or not, that is actually a normal part of writing. Yeah. To, and, and, and it's a normal part of communication to have that fear. It's a healthy part of communication. So you were able to sort of help him find a way to more effectively communicate. Uh, yeah, over time, over time. He still had struggles uh -huh. um, over the course of several weeks and months. But in time, he started developing the understanding in his communication that he had to kind of step back and he figured out a way for himself to be able to communicate through blogging, communicate on social media better and more effectively. That's really, um, that's really cool. Yeah. It, that can it, be life altering for people. Um, it, I was just very grateful to be in a, in a place that I could be able to help him out. And well, he, was, he was a consummate blogger on Zanga and uh -huh. on that website and um he really liked what we were doing with autismo but he was having his own struggles but being able to help somebody through that uh -huh. um process was a big benefit that's very cool and, and i guess i meant life altering for him not so much for you joel it's not all about yeah, you life altering for me it actually encouraged me <laughs> well yeah <laughs> <laughs> because like but, you, mean, you mean what I'm doing is actually helping somebody? <laughs> well, I just I just I just meant like that's to 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 give. Huh, I don't know that I would be here, at least in in the capacity that I am, if I had not been introduced to writing. I never wrote. I hated writing when I was a kid in high school and college. I just had not, nothing to do with it, and um, it be it was an outlet for me. It was introduced to me as an outlet, and I, I didn't. I just sort of word vomited onto the page, not thinking anybody was ever going to read it, but, but finding that outlet has, has been life altering for me. It, it helps me to process things. It helps me to be able to like write things down and then walk away from it and not be burdened uh, by it. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, being able to do that for somebody else, help them find a way to express themselves is what I was saying, I think is, is life altering. I mean, for me, it was life altering. And I would assume for anybody else being able to, to find a way to more effectively communicate would just improve their quality of life, you know, and, and, uh, yeah. how they interact with the world. So that's really, that's a really cool thing. Um, I was just, I was just very grateful. I mean, the, like you're talking about how writing 
you know, was introduced to you, I was the same way. I had English teachers that would point out to me that I could be a good writer. Uh, one actually wrote in a yearbook, you know, they, they wrote in my yearbook, uh, she wrote in my yearbook, um, life is such a terrible thing, waste. And that's the way that she wrote it as an English teacher. Mm -hmm. Life is such a terrible thing, waste. And I knew that there was a word missing in that in that sentence but my mind initially didn't see it so i was like well thanks for the signature and she kind of looked at me and she grinned and then i and then i it took me like five ten minutes i went back to it and i said someone wasn't right this is an english teacher writing this and below her signature she goes you'll get it soon and it took me about 15 minutes but i caught on to what she was saying i was missing a word and i found at that point it's like ninth grade in california and I found that in my haste to communicate, I was missing words. And that happens, I think, more and more these days. In our haste to communicate, we miss things in our communication. And that's just a human, that's just a human thing. Um, the advent of social media, the advent of all these other types of ways to communicate are so quick, but we tend to miss things in our communication. And I think it's, it serves as a reminder to me when I have these moments like this gentleman. When, when he was Very, cool. Very yeah. cool. So I will go ahead and link in the description to this episode, um, all of your main information. Um, I'll link to the podcast. I will link to uh, Autisable and uh, your, your, probably your Twitter profile, maybe. Yeah, and, yeah. uh, so, so people can reach out and communicate with you if they want to. Um, yeah, absolutely. So again, guys, this is my friend, Joel, uh, Manzer from Autisable. I really appreciate you uh, taking the time to, and patience to overcome these technical glitches that <laughs> seem to be plaguing us. Uh, and I guess I will just, well, I'll probably talk to you later, but um, yeah. you guys can, you guys can find me again at the autism dad.com. All my social links are in the top, right? Hit me up on Twitter. If you want to, uh, get to me faster and I will talk to you guys next week. Thanks. Bye. Thank you, Rob. Bye. -bye. Autistic kids can sometimes struggle to learn new skills, such as riding a bike, reading, or simply having a conversation to a high level of proficiency and automaticity. Brainiac is a brain enhancement program that gets to the root of the problem. It builds stronger brain and body connections that elevate learning capacity within four to six months. Brainiac cross-trains motor movement, visual, auditory, and cognitive thinking connections using fun, interactive video games. Strength and connections allow kids to learn new skills and perform them automatically with more confidence and greater independence. Brainiac is for homes and schools. Visit canoe.com, that's K-I-N-U-U.com, and be sure to use the code THEAUTISMDAT at checkout to save $500 it's a limited time offer and it will expire on May 31st.